Okay, meanwhile, everybody else, um, if you could if you could bump up R and uh, just as you do that, and we'll we'll all get the uh, reading and saving because I think I think there's at least one or two people who have some data, but there's probably those of you. If, if there's those of you who I haven't looked at your data yet, or you're wondering about something, um, let me know, and maybe we'll start by by sharing that Excel screen, um, you know, prior to getting into R, because in some cases, like Flavia, you're going to need, and I think I told you, like shorter variable names to go into R. But but let's do that so we kind of um, we all get our data in. And then we'll have time to to do some graphs and stuff of it. Okay, and just shout out if, if you're getting stuff set up and and something's not working. And uh, meanwhile, I'm I'm going to share my screen initially while I do that. But um, I can always pass it over to other people who want to show us something. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Okay, I'll just, uh, can you just see if you can share your screen right now? Um, let me get rid of this. Hang on, just one second. I want to give give you a microphone so oh. you don't have to yell. Oh, oh yeah. No, no, okay. the white thing here. Oh. Yeah. That's okay, I can do it. Can you hear us? Yeah, she's nodding. She's yeah. nodding? Okay. <laughs> okay, so I found some raw data on bird foraging for fish. So... I have a bunch of raw data in here. So I have like the bird species and then for categorical data, I still have to fill this out. This is stuff that I'm going to do myself, but stuff like bird color and diet. And then we have when the bird enters the water, how long it's there, how many times it attacks, if it's successful um, or if it's a failure for the fishing um and then we also got the amount of time it spends diving and then i also got the water quality data so i ended up putting all of my different uh variables here okay so uh, couple things. One, one is what I would do is start a sheet, like maybe right after, before the qualifiers have, mm -hmm. and where you're, you just want a rectangular data set. So I know, you know, I know there's reasons why you have different sheets with different stuff in it. Keep yourself organized. But just when you clean up the variables. So have one kind of like that's got the one, two, this? three. Is this what you're referring to? I made one already, but it just started at recent. Yeah, so you can add add to this sheet. Yeah. Um okay, can you go back to the summary of the yeah. Okay, so let me just work it through here. So number of fish caught. So each row is observation of a bird that's that's foraging. Is that right? Yeah, 
Yeah, so it's all about the birds. Yeah. Okay. But it's over a period of time. So number of fish caught, number of failed attempts. Mm -hmm. um, so the challenge I have with the, the qualitative response is um, Watch for the stuff, and this goes to the quantitative as well. Watch for stuff where it's a function of something else. So fishing success, you can't have um, zero fish caught and yes for fishing success. That's what I mean. You know, you know what I'm saying? So fishing success presumably means at some point, sometime they caught a fish. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess you know. So, are these two supposed to be a function of each other, the response variables? Or no, they're supposed to not be a function of each other. That's what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm just I'm on the lookout for uh, variables that are redundant. Okay. And that you know that's not totally. Yeah, it could be. It's hard to be so. <laughs> That's okay. It could be that um, just thinking about the analysis we wanted to do. This is good because the categorical data analysis we're going to do in the next lab is kind of like those of you who do toxicity stuff, um, you know, either sublethal or lethal toxicity tests. They're based on usually like dose of the of the toxicant, but also often other factors like sex or species of the fish or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Okay, so I get the first three. Um, so let's look at the predictors. So you got more than enough quantitative, so it's probably enough. I think I actually get three. Yeah, I just put a bunch because there were so many, but I can yeah, I, I, yeah. I would pare it down just for your sanity, honestly. Yeah. Um, but, and, and maybe think about it. And this, this happens to all of us in real research where you always want to observe more than you're ultimately going to use. And I, I don't like, many of you will have used techniques to sort of pick out variables for regression or whatever. I'm not talking about that really. You know, when you do that, I think it's the second question in the lab about the conceptual model. Something that's super clear to you, like the role, potential role of water temperature in fishing success or uh, time underwater, for example, seems like a good one. Whereas air temperature, maybe not, mm -hmm. dissolved oxygen. Um, I thought it could be relevant because when the dissolved oxygen changes, the fish location changes. So true. the fish might be closer to the surface depending on the oxygen content and then easier to fish, but maybe that's a bit yeah, of a stretch. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I just I, I just watch Kingfisher's parents. I don't really study them. So okay. um, anyway, what I would do is pick pick three from there. It'll just make stuff that we do like the the PCA uh, easier for you to interpret for this. We might use more for for uh, actual research later. Um, predictor variables, bird breed, and bird color. So. Um, those are going to be highly correlated. So, you know, think think of, and this is a jump for a lot of people. Um, so I'm glad you had this example. Is thinking about correlations between qualitative variables as well as quantitative. Everybody now, oh, you can't have quantitative variables that are too highly correlated. Blah blah blah. That's terrible. But qualitative. So bird breed and bird color in my limited ornithological experience they're pretty highly correlated like kingfishers are all whatever color that is okay color blind but so maybe uh come up with something for example i, I think you had king you have king yeah king so kingfishers again just my random observations when they're hunting they tend to come from a adjacent tree to the you know they come down whereas herons often uh, you know, they're walking around and, okay. and osprey more like 
they're coming from the sky. So some maybe hunting style, maybe yeah, feeding style or okay. something like that would be an interesting. I'm just gonna. Yeah, I don't forget. Qualitative. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and and that may feed into, pardon the pun, um, you know, weather conditions at the time. I don't know if those are recorded as well. Um, but yeah. So if you get if you get all that into uh, you know like variables or columns, observations or rows, um, and then and I'll get Flavia hopefully to share hers in a sec. Your spreadsheet because to to go into our um, life is just easier if you come up with like an eight letter variable name. You can have a longer description as I do in that script for the variable to help you remember what it is. But um, so just think of, you know, end fish or something, end fish pod, you know, that kind of thing. It's like sure. A, a short variable name to help you. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, for the quantitative, yeah. we only need one for each, or sorry, for the response variables. So do you think I should just use the number of failed fishing attempts instead of number of fish caught? Because it seems like that would be less connected um, to- Yeah, fish. did I set the one quantitative? I think it's- a, You asked for uh, a quantitative variable that you would expect to like change. Like be affected by the- affected, uh, yeah. uh, And then you asked for three predictor quantitative yeah. variables. Okay, so you, yeah, if you just need one, I would say num uh, number of failed attempts. Okay. Thank or you. Maybe be more positive number of successful attempts. Or whatever. But isn't that too connected to fishing success? The next one? Right. I don't know. I, yeah, okay. Um, what about number of attempts? Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, is that when you say number of failed, you know, they tried a hundred times and they failed twice. So just number of attempts is kind of their hunting pressure and then mm -hmm. success. And that means they're two different, simply two different things. So I like that. Thank okay. you. Can you yeah. share yours? Uh, you just have to stop, stop sharing. sharing. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Oh, it's yours. Yeah. <laughs> I should say to make maximum use of folks' time. If you know, if this isn't useful to you, we're not going to be hurt if you depart, right? And you have the recording. We're just. Like I said, I want people to take this time if they have it to look their stuff. Okay. So Flavia, I think maybe could you just move the mic a little closer to Flavia? Just go over quickly what these are. Um, so this is from a study that was done this summer. And basically, it looked at different treatments that were pursued in different lakes. We have two lakes here that are Scugog and Canal, and it was done throughout the summer. Uh, so I decided to compare the control uh, to a rake treatment. Um, so, so Sorry. So control slash rake, just call it treatment. Okay. Um, and so the three predictor variables that I have for qualitative data is lake, month, and true, no, yeah, treatment. Um, and then the three predictor variables that I have for quantitative data uh, is the number of weeks after treatment, hence the negative values, because that's before the treatment. Uh, where the samples were taken along the dock, um, the depth, and then the variables that would be effective, uh, the quantitative variables is the percent cover of the plants that I was investigating and whether 
the qualitative variable is whether um, a certain plant was present or not. And okay, um, so two things again, and, and I get to be persnickety just because I think it's in your interest in long term. So doc distance, just call it doc dist or something like that. So you're looking for something short, memorable, and doesn't have spaces. So it's just like one word. Um, and and then um, cover, I would call it plant cover. And depth, I'd say depth CM. You might say underscore CM. No, no. Ever use parentheses? No, correct. <laughs> hey, again, one thing you'll learn about R, if you haven't already, it's incredibly fastidious about, you know, half, lowercase, symbols, stuff like that. So, okay, plant cover. And then the last one, I would just put milfoil. M-I-L-F-O-I-L. And yeah, skip the italics. I mean, it'll pull those out anyway. And the only other comment I'd have, and um, this is, I guess, this, unfortunately for you, I know a little bit about this. So just a silly aesthetic thing, you know, shrink your columns. You want to be looking at your whole data set, you know, like center of the weeks and all that. And again, that, that sounds so totally trivial, but for me, I just, I got to be able to look at everything. Um, and do stuff like, like plant cover, express it all to two decimal places if, if that's what you're going with so it's nice now the inter there's an interesting thing and time is always for observational studies is always a vexing thing i guess that was just emphasizing that point but um so flavia's got two time appears twice here and it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out in as she analyzes stuff because so there's July, August, and I think September. Mm -hmm. And that's and and she's got that as a uh, categorical variable, I guess obviously ordinal time goes in one direction. But the interesting thing is it's it's confounded to some or correlated to some extent with week, right? You don't see a negative number for a week in September. So, and I'm not saying that, and go back to the drawing board, Claudia. It's just, because um, I'm not gonna worry about this. We're not creating a nature publication here. We're learning how to do analyses and some of the things that can happen. I'm just, I want you to be mindful of that kind of thing, especially dealing with time because um, it, it comes up primarily with uh, month, week as opposed to year timing because uh, yeah because because of that linearity of time and and sometimes a time of day is another tricky one because uh, uh, 11 30 p.m is closer to uh, like time time is in a circle and so it's very close to 12.30 a.m., even though it doesn't seem that way if you're using, you know, 0030 for 12.30 a.m., 11.30 for 12.30 p.m. So there's ways to deal with that. And if you do have that situation with your research data, happy to talk about it offline, but just be careful. The other thing, which, again, we, we won't get into uh, in this course, but I'm happy to discuss otherwise, is the whole... Um, package of what's called repeated measures. So when you're looking at an experimental unit repeatedly through time, that introduces some um, complexity to the to the uh, analysis. It's interestingly not the case with Flavia's, I know, because when she does that sampling, she's, she's sampling, she's not going to the same Quadra each time when she's actually looking at the uh, those areas beside the docks. But again, whenever time is part of your study, uh, whether you're repeatedly measuring something or not, um, it's worth a very careful look at it.
Anyway, I think I think you're set to go, Flavia. So in a couple of minutes, we'll actually get your data. And if you haven't done it already, we'll get your data into R. Um, yeah, I have issues with getting it into R. There's a lot of errors. Yeah, we'll, we'll solve that. <laughs> uh, sure, Jenny. Yeah, let me see if that one. Okay, and uh... so this is pretty much um, blood stain patterns I made. So um, the area of the parent stain, so like the main biggest stain is here, the perimeter of that said stain, uh, the height that it was made at, how many blood drops, so one to 10 drops, um, the substrate, so either paper or like grass. What? Grass, like grass. at outside too, okay. which pretty much is like location, like. F and G are pretty much like if it's paper, it was done inside versus location. Um, if it was grass, it was outdoors. Oh, um, so they're perfectly correlated. Yeah, I did do one paper that was out, out, <laughs> yeah, so I had to redo it inside. So we don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then temperature, like room temp versus outside, where it was four degrees. And then this is just the total stains of the entire pattern, not just the pattern, like the parent stain. Okay. Yeah. So interesting. So a couple of maybe similar issues going on. So what do you see as the response variables that you kind of, you know, response would be, I want to predict uh, area from temperature and height, you know, that, that, mm -hmm. is that, so is area and perimeter would, would they be kind of like response variables, do you think? Area, perimeter, and total stains would be a response from uh, the total drops and like the height. I, sorry, area, perimeter, and what was the And term? the total stains, like the last column. The total stains. Okay. Yeah, just because the, the higher you drop it, there might there be, should just be more okay. energy putting out. So what I would do, uh, again, to kind of keep you, you know, keep straight about response versus predictor. Yeah. I would kind of reorder the columns so you see that. Yeah. Um, and then remember I wanted a categorical uh, response. So like, I don't know, really red or, you know, something, some way that you could classify the stain yeah. that you're trying to predict from the other things. Okay. That's not a number kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You can think of that. I can do color then, yeah. Um, so with the predictors, the the challenge I have is height's fine. So how, how many different heights are there? Um, three. Just try to scroll up. Yeah, <laughs> twenty five and fifty. It's just the two. Okay, but there, there's twenty five and fifty in each situation. So you get. At 25, you got one in 10 drops, kind of thing. And then 50, I went one in 10 drops, yeah. Okay. So the, the tricky one is um, you scroll back up to the top. Yeah. And I often use, again, forgive me, like I often use freeze the first row so that I always see oh. you do that in Excel. So you're always seeing those columns. Kind of, people do that, right? And if it's a long thing, then I'll I'll freeze, I'll go into the corner and freeze both the first column or a couple of columns and the first row. It just helps me look at the data without because I forget stuff. Um so I think the the challenge is with the categorical uh, predictors because they're perfectly correlated, right? There's paper indoors. There's grass outdoors. Yeah. And in fact, the categorical and the temperature are correlated because it's cold outdoors. Yeah. Um, so, and I mean, what I would do if you can find some other information that you think will help you predict mm -hmm. um, the, the area perimeter total stains. Because right now, okay, if you do this, and different analyses we're going to use, and it, you know, you don't need to know stats to know 
you're not going to be able to tell was it paper versus grass or the fact that it was bloody cold outside yeah. the grass was and so that's why um you know people people bother to bring in i guess a roll of sod indoors mm -hmm. or whatever um and that you know this may be the way that people do things <laughs> and that's fine but i guess recognizing that limitation will be important so, so so bottom line is and i'm not saying you know don't do that or whatever but if you can find it'll just be more interesting to look at yeah. if you can find a, a different kind of categorical descriptor um i don't know if the, the blood source was probably all the same so that well you're you're the expert so you would know but if you can find something that yeah, uh, I can figure. I can find something. I mean, meanwhile, we can make we can get these data in. So yeah. you've got that part done, and and then uh, you can tweak, you know, what's in the spreadsheet mm -hmm. and read uh, later. You were, I think you were gonna, Brandy, you were gonna ask me something about. Oh no, I was just saying I was also bringing our getting the okay error codes. So so, so let me. Uh, oh, sir. Emily, have you got? Remind me. <laughs> Did you already tell us what your data is? Sorry. Uh, you cut out a bit there. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I guess I need. Well, I'll put my microphone back on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, there you go. There, I think, think that might be better. Yeah, it's better. Did you tell us about your data? I'm sorry, I've heard so much data. Okay, have you got any data to tell us about? Or are you still thinking about this? Uh, no, I have. I have data for both my chapters. I'm working on the data analysis right. For them right now, so I have a data set for the lab assignment. Okay, did you send it to me again? I'm sorry. <laughs> I did, but I can share it now. We can go through it. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, just the spreadsheet version, just to. I don't know if I said anything brilliant or whatever about it, but you hadn't gotten back to me yet, but I figured I'd see you in class. <laughs> okay, like <laughs> okay. So do you want to tell us tell us about it or tell other people about it? Yeah. Uh so my first chapter uh is comparing different fish sampling methods uh to see what species they're detecting and what species they're missing. So right now, um, you'll see this percent missed by BSM. Uh, BSM stands for Broad Scale Monitoring Program, and that's the province's standard uh, uh, gill nets for assessing fish communities and lakes. And I'm trying to see how much, uh, how many species the gill nets are missing, and if we can supplement them with qualitative sampling methods to improve uh, richness estimates. Um, so I have 30 lakes uh, in and around Sudbury. So some of them are within the historical acid damage zone. Some of them are outside of it. So they're acting as a reference. Um, we've assessed species richness for each lake, but it's not a true species richness. It's just what we've detected with our sampling methods. So it was with the, the gill sampling that the D, D sort of tells you how many you missed and C is what what you found? Same method or yeah. qualitative method? D is what we found using what we've called the combo protocol. So it's okay. uh, BSM surveys in conjunction with uh, targeted sampling methods. So targeted sampling for Burbit and Sculpin and then near shore and tributary. Uh, sampling as well. So it's cumulatively, it's six different sampling methods get it, get applied to the same lake. And then, uh, so like for Big Spring, we detected 12 species, but we only detected, or we missed 8% of species just using the BSM program. So one of the 12. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to do the math in my head and it wasn't happening. <laughs> well, 
that that's about the outer limits of my math. Okay, so uh, this is really cool. So, so the quantitative response would be percent missed by, I guess. Yeah, and species richness. And species richness. What about a categorical response? Uh, right now I have acid, like acid status. So whether it was historically damaged, um, cause that'll affect. Yeah, that's, but that's more of a predictor, right? I mean, what, yeah. I, what, what I want you to try, and this is just so you, I don't know if you've done anything with categorical data analysis before, but like I was saying, it's kind of like a tox test where you say, okay, I've got this concentration of a toxicant, um, here, here's whether the fish lived or died kind of thing. And, you know, it, that kind of log linear categorical analysis. So if you can come up with something and I'm just, I don't know, one, one thing that might be interesting is, um, you know, percent missed, was it less than 25 or not? You know, something like that might be, better than you only need one quantitative response which could be species richness and then the other one the the percent missed by bsm is a little bit of uh you know i don't know how precise that can be anyway so you might say is this really shit is bsm really working shittily in this like percent miss was greater than 25 that you know that that kind of a thing might be kind of a cool way to look at it so you're not you're not asking more of the predictors than really they can do by saying oh give me the percent miss by bsm to the second decimal place rather you're saying is it a really bad lake for you know what i mean so if you took that column and then just said if it's greater than i, I don't know I, I can't see all the numbers but if it's greater than 25 it's uh, bad if it's less than 25 it's good or something something like that might be fun to look at it would end up being like categories of good versus bad or more than well, yeah good good versus bad bsm sampling okay right because that as that number gets higher bsm has not worked as well in the lake right yeah because uh like the the initial studies we did we find that BSM misses about, uh, or, or only detects 75% of species, but we're finding that number changes and whether that's a part of um, like lake depth versus lake area and those species oh, relationships. Yeah, and it's also, um, there. there's probably some correlation between those two responses, right? Like, um, the richer, the more species that are there, the less, the more app, maybe the method is to miss one or, you know, something like that. Yeah. I know that happens in the, in the benthic invert world for sure. But, okay. So, um, and then you've got, looks like you've got various properties of the lake as quantitative predictors. And I would say the acid damage thing is a, is a categorical predictor, you know, um, and I think I, did I ask for more than one categorical predictor? Uh, you asked for three. For, yeah. You're thinking, for, yeah. So, um, and I don't, oh yeah, you got the urbanization. So that's categorical. Remind me what FMZ is. I know it's one of your fisheries. Fisheries management zone. <laughs> okay, so there's three categorical right there. And what I would do, um, I mean, you've also got SMB, is that smallmouth bass presence? Uh, yeah, because we find uh, littoral, like near shore species richness tends to be lower in lakes where we have smallmouth bass introduced just because they're such yeah. a. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, pick pick three, and what I would say is pick three of the quantitative. I, I mean, you're probably interested in all these in writing your chapter, but for the purpose of doing the labs and that, I would, as I I was saying to Raina, I think, um, you know, just winnow out 
tree so that it'll just make it easier for you to wrap your head around some of the analyses. Okay. And you've got these in R, it sounds like already. Yeah, I, uh, my chapter you're, one. Do you're way time. ahead, like, you know. <laughs> okay, so you can, you can do lab one, you can go, you know, go have a beer. Maybe later. <laughs> okay. So do you want to, at this point, do you want me to, I'll get, I'll get our out and we'll tackle the, if everybody can kind of get there, reading their spreadsheet and I'll bring mine out. Has everybody got a copy of the reading, like the lab one, those scripts that I had? Hmm? Okay. Yeah. Um, like I said, I was futzing around with it. So let me, what I'll do to keep it easy is I'll make sure it's available and I'll just in the chat room, I'll, I'll put the link to it and then copy it onto something so that you're not dependent on mine. Uh, hang on one sec. <laughs> this is so uh, meta, you know. <laughs> it's multiple sharing. My head's going to explode. Um, Sorry, I'm on the, all the multivariate ones here. So hopefully everybody except Judy and Judy will get you on to our and our studio and all that. Um, we can chat about that, but everybody has got to this point. Um, probably, and I, I mentioned to you about being super hyper about data organization, data and script organization. Otherwise, as I'm sure Emily would agree, it becomes a wild animal pretty fast when you save different versions of scripts. Like you're going to want to save a script with a different name than the one that you uh, read from me. So I'm going to just click on reading, saving, labeling, exporting a data set in R. And uh, just based on the time, we'll probably spend more time on here than, but once you've got this, the stuff about bar charts and, and box plots and that, it's pretty simple. This this tends to be the toughest part. And then um, others, we'll do what we can, but uh, for those ones, probably best if we go on the basis of try to do them and then get to me when you get, you get jammed. Okay, so I think you can all see uh, my reading and, and saving. Um, I mentioned last week, and there's some stuff in here. Jeez, uh, oh, I guess I should have done what I said I was going to do in terms of putting the, sorry, putting the script in the chat room. Just one sec. Why is this not? Um. Six. Uh, what is this doing? So weird. Okay. Copy link. Somebody please try this right away. And uh, the challenge, of course, with uh, R files is because they're 
weirdly formatted. You, you'll probably want to right click on this and save as, but someone, if they, if you could try it right now, this will help us a lot in future sessions. If you get that, did you get it? Okay. Um, the other thing that I'll, I'll post, and I asked Mike permission on this, is uh, you can download the Chinook Salmon data set that I've used for several years, and I finally remembered to ask him if it was okay for me to use so He remembered the course fondly, by the way. So if you right-click on that, that's an should be an Excel file that is the uh, is sort of the raw. Okay, and I'm gonna open that. I should have done that before. Made a window into my complex life here. <laughs> there we go. You know, cloud uh, storage is great, but when you get up to seven or eight different <laughs> cloud storage accounts, it gets be kind of a headache. Okay, so there's there's what Mike's Chinook data set looked like. And as I was saying last week, you've got just the ID number of the fish and then uh, population, uh, two different uh, river systems, I think, draining into Lake Superior or Lake Huron. Sex of the fish, ripeness, like sexual maturity, whether or not lamprey parasite, and then three different uh, morphometric measures. So that's what the the spreadsheet is. And what I would suggest is like I've done here, notice I've got, I've labeled the sheet data for R. So I've taken it from different places as all of you have and put it in a sort of a flat file like this, ready to ready to inhale into R. So first thing you do in the R script is these packages, which I've already downloaded and that do various things and three packages that are used in this particular script. So I'll run, I'll run that. And uh, they're there now. And I, I strongly recommend um, you know, as, as you modify something, like I'm going to look at these few lines, uh, run them a few lines at a time, and then uh, and do it as I talk. So if somebody gets the error, then, then we can talk about it. So what I have here, the first couple of lines, this is the where the rubber meets the road. Essentially, I've, I've labeled that spreadsheet it's critical, you know, labeling differs slightly, uh, pointing it towards files differs slightly if you're in PC versus Mac land, but um, the dot in Mac version, I think it's different in PC if there's others using PC, the, the dot is kind of the folder where I've got this R project sitting. The R project that I call grad stats underscore R. So, and this is in quote marks. See the double quote marks indicating the name of the spreadsheet and the location of it. Um, and then it's just, there's a function called read underscore Excel. That's from one of those packages that I uh, opened up, up up top there. And I'm reading that Excel spreadsheet into a variable called Chinook. And this is within the running of the R program. I haven't yet written the R data set. I'm just reading it in so I can do stuff with it now. 
So did everybody get to that point or kill? Cool? Okay, great. So the next part is entirely voluntary, but for me, especially, you know, then now I'm into my senior years, I kind of forget. And this is just a way it, it's, it's actually ported over from SPSS where you can label variables and it'll associate those, those label names. If you tell it to, um, with, with the actual data set, as we'll see in a minute, but it also used them in different contexts for access labels and stuff like that. So super valuable in kind of remembering that snout height was measured in millimeters. You know, it's just the definition of variables because you forget, you know, you start you start assembling, like Emily was showing, you know, 20, 20 different variables there. And even she would forget um, what, what something was so I find these valuable but they're you know you can do all the analyses we're going to do without ever labeling your variables so did anybody try that or do that and any any issues with that if you tried it okay so I'll don't think I ran that yet so I'll run that and see <laughs> so what so here we have an example entirely on purpose of an error message in R. So if I look down, um, it says attach variable levels that will stick with the R data set for future variable, should be labels. Um, and it says object Chinook not found. Did I, maybe I didn't run the actual. <laughs> So that, again, I wish I'd done that on purpose, but of course I didn't. So you have to be hyper careful with R. And also when you do something like that, you know, if you weren't here with me, I'd say, what the hell happened? And deciphering what, what kind of mistakes you make can be a frustrating experience. So there I ran the line that actually input the data. So that's cool. And uh, yeah, it seems to have labeled the variables. Now you can start to check because up here, I have read the data set in and remember up in the top right corner is sort of the list of all the variables. Remember I had Flavia and Bob and all that. So in the session that we're in right now, these are the variables that are there to do some stuff with. And there's this thing called Chinook, which is 80 observations of eight variables. So that sounds promising. So if I hit this miniature spreadsheet over here, then it, one of the tabs up in the top left becomes that what it's read in. And this way I can check to make sure that I didn't screw things up, which I have many times in just, you know, my spreadsheet was formulated properly. And notice that the variable label thing is appearing, see underneath the ID and it's got fish ID code, you know, all, all that stuff. Um, so that's great. It looks looks good. So I'll go back to the script. The next thing I do is it again, it, it's kind of a you don't have to do it, but it's um, it's helpful. I always like to make sure I keep track of variables, keep track of levels of uh, categorical variables, what they are in words, because often uh, levels are coded. So that's what's going on here. The there's uh, the categorical variables in the data set include pop, the population that came from, uh, sex, the sex of the fish, ripe, the, the uh, maturity of the fish, and lamprey, whether there's a lamprey attached. And you can see in each of these, I do, I do what's called, I make a factor out of those variables. And just so you see the, the terminology there, see where it says Chinook dollar sign pop, that means in the Chinook data set, the variable pop, and then I want it assigned to Chinook dollar sign pop made into what's called a factor. And that just makes it, it doesn't change the values, but it makes it more amenable to the sort of like ANOVA t-test analyses we're gonna do. And I tell it, make it a factor, so-called factor. Here are the levels of that factor north and uh, N and S, and here are the labels I want on those levels. So I spell out north, south, 
or male, female, or immature and ripe, or yes and no for the lamprey one. So if we run those, Again, it seems to have worked. I didn't get any error message down below. And if I magically, if I go back to the tab that's got the data set, now it's got those factor levels on there. No, it doesn't. Oh. Hang on. Let me do this. There. Sorry, I had to reopen it, the mini spreadsheet. So now, rather than N and S, it's got North and South, and it's got male, female, and ripe and immature, and all that. So that's great. So that means I can, even if my spreadsheet of data that I got from the taper study or from the the blood spatter analysis machine or whatever, it's got these little weird numbers. I can do that that kind of level labeling thing. So this actually will make a lot more sense when I come to actually do plots and stuff like that that can go right into my thesis rather than me having to translate or there's nothing worse than having, you know, like a bar chart which has got one zero and then oh yeah, one equals yeah, you know, all that stuff. You can actually have it labeled with what you want it labeled with, which I find really useful. Um Okay, so nothing much left to do except actually save it. So just like you, you know, if you do some changes to an Excel spreadsheet or whatever, we've we've just labeled variables and we've labeled levels and stuff like that. So we want to save it as an R data set. So we don't have to go through this every time we do an analysis or a plot. So the lines that are left here are three different ways we can take that data set with the enhancements we've made, and we can write it on the disk as new files. So the first one is saving it as an R data set that I call Chinook table.rds. The second one is writing another Excel spreadsheet. And so this is not going to be the same as Mike's initial one. This is going to have all that labeling, or it should if it works. And then the third one is is just same thing, but it's a CSV file in case like there's some GIS stuff I do where I need to get stuff in with a, a CSV file. So, so I'm just doing all three of them here, just just for fun. So I have fun now. And they all seem to have worked. And you can see that. Well, if you look over where the the files here, um, there's Chinook labeled dot CSV and Chinook label.xlsx, they were both created like one minute ago, and Chinook table.rds also created one minute ago. So has everybody got that? And it's 402. So we're gonna wrap up, but I can't wrap up without actually doing a plot, right? So just give me an extra 30 seconds. Now that you have the data there, you know, you're pointing to where where um, the store data with labels and all that stuff. Um, what do we do? What do we do? Well, let's do my favorite box plots, the group box plots, quantitative variable. So, and I I try to make the the structure similar as possible i try to use the hashtags and the you know the comments because you can remind yourself what you did and if you folks come up with better stuff than me that would be great because i can steal it um so when you get into the plotting this is where that book that i've got the link to free book uh by hadley wickham gg plot it's a it's a relative well it's slightly newer way to do plots in R. There's there's the grammar of graphics. That's what GG stands for. So it's a whole world. It seems incredibly obscure and complex at first. That's why I'm giving you these, but incredible flexibility in doing that. But I, all I want you to see is initially line seven here is I'm reading that Chinook table.rds. So it's got that data set. So let me show you, I'll just use the broom 
up here in the top right, get rid of all the variables that it's stored up there. And I'll run this first seven lines where it's reading in the data set. And there's Chinook back again, and it's the Chinook that has you know all those all those labels and everything. That's great. So what you see beyond that is just me saying things. Here's the title I want. Here's a subtitle. Here's a variable label from that first exercise we did. So you'll be able to track, or what I want you to do is track yours in here. Initially, you're just sort of you know replacing Mike Chinook salmon stuff with your data stuff. You're going to screw up the first couple of times you do it, but and then you're you've got variables. In this case, we've got uh, snout snout height and uh, a, um, what was the quantitative variable? Lamprey attachment or qualitative variable. So let's let's just run these and then I'll leave you to experiment with yours. See if this still works. So if we go over to plots and I'm gonna I'll finish by putting this this uh, script in the chat box so you can link to it and copy it in. So that there's a beautiful plot. I mean, that could be in a publication, wouldn't ha quite have that subtitle and stuff like that. But you've got this nice, the rows are the maturity of the fish. The columns of plots are male and female. And then within those columns, same scale on each. It's just such an informative plot, but it's it's nice. It's simple. It's efficient. You've got yes or no is is there a lamprey attached so um there's that one and i will like i said i'll i'll finish by going over and grabbing it the worst problem i have here is dealing with uh google drives file list and i'll just stick that in and uh yeah, let me know if you're playing with this and you get gummed up. The, a common question, because I, I sort of give you enough rope to hang yourself, is do some plots and tables to tell me about your... I said, people want to know, because the sort of leftover mentality from undergrad, how many, you know, like, how many, how many words should I use to explain this plot? And, you know, I want to know about your data. Part of it's obviously that decision... What you write about it should be similar to what you'd write if you were doing like a results section in a paper. Say, well, there tends to be more of this than this. You know, you'll feel weird because, oh, I don't have a statistical test that lets me do that. Just write about what you see in those plots. Don't try to do every possible plot or use every script in every possible configuration. If you're unsure if you've got enough or too much, just just show, uh, shoot me a message and... Uh, I'll get back to you on it, okay? Um, so let me put that, did I put that link already? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry about the seven minutes overtime. Next time I'll make the lecture more efficient. <laughs>